Today on Power Forward, we're diving deep into solar supply chain issues with David Dunlap, Vice President of Operations, Baywa RE Solar Systems. Thanks for taking the time today, David. Absolutely, my pleasure, Chris. Nice to nice to see you. We're chatting in uh, about mid-November, and this will hit the air beginning of December. So, with that time frame in mind, um, can you talk broadly about the supply chain challenges that there are right now for our audience? Uh, not everyone is tracking these issues, you know, at the same level as you. So, take us broad up to that. 30,000 foot perch of yours. I think everyone is aware of the supply chain constraints and challenges, even if mostly just from a consumer point of view, right? Grocery stores, paper goods, retail products, computers, cars, you know, anybody tried to buy a bicycle recently? Um, I have colleagues that are waiting nine months for their bicycle to <laughs> arrive from a special order. Um, so I think, you know, in fact, all goods imported to the U.S. right now, and even many that are produced here, but trucked great distances across the country are being negatively impacted, whether it's COVID issues or driver shortages or other labor shortages, rising costs. Um, recently, there was a Chinese energy use curtailments for, for emissions. Um, but, you know, just like everywhere you can imagine constraints across the supply chain. Specific to solar products, um, we see massive port congestion and truck driver shortages delaying the imports and causing us to burn through existing inventory that's already uh, landed stateside faster than it can be replaced by those incoming goods. So I think the good news is this will get better with time. The bad news is that we still have, in my opinion, easily another six to nine months of these kinds of extreme constraints and delays. Um, as well as the elevated prices. So I don't expect to see a whole lot of improvement until probably mid-year next year. Um, and, and even then, I expect it to be more of a slow recovery through the end of 2022. Um, and I do think some of the high costs we've seen are going to start to recover, but I don't expect them to go back to the extremely low uh, rates that we saw in 2019 and before, at least not for a while. David, in your role at, at Baywa, uh, you know, a solar distributor, you're seeing things from that unique perspective, you know, sitting at the nexus of product and technology with the manufacturers, logistics, uh, with the solar contractors. Um, and those so contractors are relying on uh, Baywa to deliver products and sustain, the, you know, their businesses. So it must be super challenging in your position right now. How does a distributor, the size and scale of a Baywa RE and that position manage these challenges? So it's been an interesting year for us, for sure. Um, and we've been navigating COVID and the supply challenges, um, and we've been growing and changing as an organization. Um, we This year, we moved into an agile structure as a company, and I won't go into the weeds here. People can read about agile structures in business, um, particularly in software. Um, but our focus has really been to figure out the the best and most efficient ways to support our customers. So if we use the current supply chain challenges as an example, as a company, we're better positioned to serve our customers because we're looking at the end-to-end -end processes that support a great customer experience. And we're building our teams around delivering that value. So a big component of that is communication and arming our regional sales crews and our customer facing interactions with the knowledge and the access to information that our customers need when they need it. And even through our web store, which is available 24 seven with real time information on product availability, inbound date adjustments, updated pricing, open order status, account details. We're also tracking product lifecycle changes in a more transparent and robust way so that our sales reps are armed with the answers to installers questions quickly and confidently. You know, being able to talk with an installer about when to stop selling an end of life item and move up to the next generation so that their pipeline aligns with the inventory availability in the channel, both coming and going. So it's really about keeping pace with that and, and being able to, um, to react quickly to these uh, constantly shifting sands. You know, most sol solar contractors that want to know, let's get straight to the point, you know, will I have product when I need it in 2022? And if not, what should I do? You know, which products should I focus on? Uh, just any advice you can impart in, in that area. I wish I had a crystal ball, <laughs> right? Be able to to hone in on 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 the exact particulars that each listener wants to hear about. Um, we work very closely with our manufacturers, and and we I believe we create resiliency uh, through our deep partnerships and our mutual trust and alignment. 
Um, likewise, we dialogue with our customers and value two-way transparency, constant communication, and even a willingness to deliver bad news in addition to good news. Advanced planning is definitely key. Um, and for this reason, we show availability as well as future inbounds on our web store. Even if the dates change, um, our, our customers tell us that just knowing that we're still buying that item and the, the product is still coming into our inventory gives them a good signal about what to plan their business around. Having insight into our customers' pipelines and having the discussions where we can evaluate risk. I think gone are the days when a medium or a large size installer can just assume that any solar supplier or distributor will just have what they need sitting on the shelf. Right, um, small quantities, commodity type items, sure, those those shouldn't uh, be much of an issue. But core run rate products, um, we're happy to plan with anybody um, to, and support the run rates and forecasted business. But we need that commitment to communication and two way partnership so that we both can navigate it in a healthy and a sustainable way. Uh, are there manufacturers that you think are uniquely positioned to succeed in twenty twenty two? Or who, or maybe uh, who might have fewer challenges in terms of product availability. Our line card strategy has always been to position the best in class technology aimed towards its strength and the market demand. So honestly, I think there are many manufacturers that we could name that are poised to succeed, but maybe not all for the same reasons. An example, and I think many people could figure out who we're talking about here, but a module company that has already been pursuing non-Chinese manufacturing and components produced outside of China. Um, they'd be ahead of the curve right now in terms of the USA policy um, that demands evidence of no forced labor involved in production of, of their products. But a very large vertically integrated company that can pivot their supply chain or has the ability to secure large volume contracts with the right suppliers and component manufacturers can also achieve the same policy compliance and they won't be that far behind. What do you think on the uh, technology and innovation side of things? Anything in particular, any manufacturers there that you're uh, you know, most interested in in 2022 that who could make an impact? Looking to the, the existing leaders, I, I don't, I mean, I, there's always innovation. There's always new, exciting things coming on board. I think we're a little ways away from the big leaps um, as we max out the, um, the current efficiencies within the monoperk um, technology for solar modules, and we move towards um, some different cell technologies, we're going to sort of make a leapfrog where we're back to the sort of earlier stages of new technology development um, that may reset pricing and um, sort of early um, early uh, product release and then moving through those advancements and technology curves again. Um, I think 2022 is going to be a bit of a recovery year in many ways. Um, because of the challenges with COVID and the supply chain. So I'm looking for incremental adjustments and kind of getting back to norm, maybe more so than some some big radical new changes. So shifting gears a little bit. Um, so is there anything you'd like to maybe highlight on the policy side of things that a solar contractor should be paying attention to headed into 2022? Absolutely. The policy landscape has been... Um, Wow, it's just like getting bludgeoned uh, constantly with with all of the changes and and trying to keep up. Um, good news, as of just um, a Monday prior to this recording, we're we're over the hump of the the anti dumping and countervailing duties, the ADCBD petition um, that was filed in August. Um, with the Department of Commerce opting not to take up that petition investigation. It doesn't mean it won't come back in some form. There's still, you know, definitely continued challenges around U.S.-based um, module manufacturing, trying to match the Chinese in terms of volume and price efficiency. Um, but um, there's legislation being considered now in Congress that is very favorable to new manufacturing incentives um, and significant investments over the next um, six to 18 months. We still have some uncertainty um, before us around the WRO and the forced labor um, being utilized in manufacturing of solar products. I think the high level guidance that I would offer is count on a certain amount of price flattening. Um, there's sort of both upwards and downwards pressures, the supply chain and, and contraction constraints obviously is an upward price pressure, um, but the removal of the um, concern around ADCVD 
um, I think helps uh, in, in, a, in a positive way. The Section 201 tariff um, may very well get renewed, but it's not going to be at a higher rate. That's, that's governed by the law. Um, it can't be a higher rate than it is currently. Um, and then we also recently heard that the bifacial exemption uh, comes back. Um, and so that's kind of a positive downward uh, price opportunity. I see demand staying very high as the ITC is also likely to get extended. Um, so in general, I would, I would uh, guide installers to plan for continued increase uh, consumer demand. Don't expect the pricing to just suddenly fall off a cliff, but also don't expect a sudden skyrocketing for, for Asian imports. Um, and give yourself scheduling and inventory buffers um, because we've got to keep accounting for some continued supply chain challenges well into next year. Can you give a status update on the enforcement of the WRO uh, holding modules at the border? How much product is tied up in that? What's been, what's been the impact thus far? I think most of the information has been publicly acknowledged and, and published, whether through Roth Capital or others. But um, three uh, primary names that that are out there, um, Jinko, Trina, and Longji, um, none of uh, whom have successfully run the gauntlet with uh, CBP and the traceability protocols. So all the product that was held um, which is probably north of 100 megawatts now uh, total across all three, um, has yet to be uh, officially blessed from an inspection uh, standpoint and released. Likewise, none of it has been officially rejected either, right? So I think this is what's kind of interesting about it is um, as an industry, we started um, throwing out some, some um, labels like... Um, they were detained or they were um, uh, denied uh, clearance or, or uh, there's a couple other um, terms I'm blanking on now. But um, in, in fact, the process works as we need to inspect your product. So we're holding you, detaining you for inspection. The result of the inspection then results in enforcement, right? And so if the inspection reveals uh, components you know, that are against the WRO and there's strong evidence of forced labor involved in the components of the manufacturing, then those would actually uh, then go to an enforcement stage, which is either re-export by the importer or destruction. That hasn't happened. To my knowledge, nobody has actually been assessed with that level of this is the final uh, de determination. So everyone else is really just still, uh, everybody is in that early stage of investigation, um, but it's creating this huge backlog of nothing's coming through. So then what about this? And in the short term, it means, you know, from an installer standpoint, or uh, even from my standpoint, I've got to buy something else that is getting through. It is my belief that that all of um, these companies have a path to compliance, um, whether that's exactly the product that is at port now being investigated or what they have the ability to produce coming behind it. Um, but since no one has actually completed that yet, it's still sort of time will tell. Do you know the inspection timeline? Unfortunately, no. Um, <laughs> the, because we work with um, Trina, um, some of the early communications were some of their product was earmarked for kind of expedited inspection um, and others were sort of an undefined time frame, but even that expedited that was originally indicated that would be, you know, like 10 to 14 days came and went. Um, and after a month and a half, two months, Trina, you know, did the right thing and said, we don't know what's gonna happen with this. Our recommendation is we cancel these orders and and you move on to something else. And that that's that's one of those examples of great partnership where that's really painful for a manufacturer to admit defeat and say, I can't service your business. And yet it's better for us to acknowledge that and move on to the next thing, knowing that down the road, we very likely will be able to, to transact again, right? Well, as we wrap up here, uh, is there just anything else solar contractors should be thinking about in the coming year or two ahead? Anything installers can do to build resiliency into their business models. Um, the ability to adapt and change course quickly will be a benefit. Um, consider how you sell solar today and what you can do to incorporate changes and substitutions of products or specifications more easily than in the past. Um, that'll allow you to pivot when you have to. 
So an example might be um, going from a different wattage of module without a complicated change order to the homeowner um, or having to take a loss on the project and still satisfy, satisfy your customer. Don't assume pricing always goes down. Um, we got really used to a continual downward trend on pricing in solar. And I think what I've um, seen in, in other markets, particularly in Europe, is a commoditization where it's normal for prices to fluctuate up and down rather than be on a constant, if I just wait a month, I'll get a better deal. Um, I, think, I think we're past that point. And then um, strengthen your partnerships. Be willing to share, be a little bit more transparent about your goals and your needs. I believe we'll get through this together through co collaboration and, and uh, a focus on mutual gains and a shared commitment to the end consumer, which will benefit you know, everyone with installed clean solar energy. Great wrap up there, uh, David. I appreciate all of that insight. Um, and just thanks for taking the time today to chat with us. Absolutely, Chris. My pleasure.